Haven Arrest Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School Lesson Number 12, Sunday, November 20, 2016. The lesson is entitled Living Waters. The lesson comes from Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 through 7. We were asked to read the same. The place is from Patmos. The time is 96 AD. Life is such a wonderful word. It may make us think contentedly of such things as the budding of trees in the spring or the birth of a little baby. These instances of life, however, pale in comparison to the life we will have for all eternity. Only Jesus can bring us true life. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. John 10.10 10. This week's lesson will help us understand more about true life as we study the river of living water. Today's aim, facts, to get, a, to get a clearer understanding of the river of life in the New Jerusalem. Principle, to grow in appreciation for the blessing of eternal life and all that it brings to us. Application, to ensure, to experience more of the abundant life that Jesus Christ has made available to us. Illustrating the lesson, we can experience the blessings of God's abundant life now. Today we have three outlines. The helpful environment of the New Jerusalem, Revelations 22, 1 through 3a. The impact of God's presence, Revelations 22, 3b through 5. The certainty, 3, the certainty of God's return, Revelations 22, 6 through 7. Introduction. Ever since God pronounced the curse in the Garden of Eden, men have been trying to eliminate its results. Unsensing efforts attempt to recreate the ideal environment for human life and they include several endeavors. One of these is to provide an abundant supply of pure, fresh water. Conservation of the present supply is combined with searches for new sources within the earth. Purification systems strive to eliminate contaminants that, wa that make water un unusable. Another high priority is the production of healthy food. There are ongoing efforts to eliminate pollutants and harmful chemi chemicals from soil and air and to find more healthy ways to process and prepare food. It is interesting to think of these human aspirations in light of God's description of life in his eternal city. We find such a description in this week's lesson. Conditions there will transcend even the fondest human visions. The, help, the healthful environment of the new Jerusalem. Revelations 22, 1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. Verse 2. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. 3a. And there shall be no more curse, the water of life. Revelations 22a. While the eternal abode of God and the redeemed is picture in, pictured in Revelations 22 as a city, not a garden, it nevertheless has features resembling a garden within the city. Thus, it bears a striking resemblance to the Garden of Eden. One detail that is similar is given in chapter 22, verse 1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life. Genesis 2.10 In scripture, water is often a symbol of the working of the Holy Spirit in salvation, either as a cleansing agent, Titus 3.5, or as the quencher of spiritual thirst, Isaiah 44, 3, John 4, 13 through 14, 7, 37 through 39. This imagery is found in Revelation as well. 7, 17, 21, 6, 22, 17. So in the river, 
in the New Jerusalem symbolizes God's never failing provision to satisfy the spiritual needs of his people. This river is portrayed as pure and clear as crystal, Revelations 21, 22.1. It is not like the cisterns of Israel that caught and stored rainwater, for that would eventually stagnate and become unusable. Rather, it portrays sparkling, uncontaminated water, ever fresh and satisfying. That is understandable. For this river will proceed from the throne of God. How could the water be anything but pure when its source is holy? Its life-given prophecies are due to the one who is the source of all life. It is also appropriate that it is said to proceed from the Lamb, Jesus Christ. It is he who sacrificed himself for the sin of the world, John 1-2 and provides the living water of salvation, verses 4, 13 through 14. Ezekiel also saw in his prophetic vision a river of living water, Ezekiel 47, 1 through 12, and Zechariah 14, 8 mentions it as well, but that was a river in the millennial kingdom, not the eternal city. Its source will be the temple in Jerusalem and its course is defined by earthly landmarks. The river in John's vision will come from God's throne, not the temple. For the new Jerusalem will have no temple, Revelations 21, 22. The two streams are therefore different. The tree of life, Revelations 22, 2. In the midst of the street of it should be taken to conclude the thought of verse 1. The river of the water of life, which begins at God's throne, will flow down the middle of the thoroughfare that begins there and take its life-given prophecies throughout the entire city. Then, on either side of the river, John saw the tree of life. Here is the second similarity to the Garden of Eden, Genesis 2.9. Whether Adam and Eve ate from this tree before they sinned, we do not know. But afterward, they were kept away from it so that they would not live forever in their sinful conditions. Verses chapter 3, verses 22 to 24. The tree of life could not continue to exist in a sinful world, but it will finally have its use in God's eternal kingdom. Revelations 2, 7, 22, 14. It is a riddle to us how a single tree could be on either side of the river, Revelations 22, 2. Though several explanations have been offered, it seems best to take the singular as the collective term for multiple trees. This would then mean that, as in Ezekiel's vision, Ezekiel 47, 12, numerous trees will grow along the river, but all the same kind. The tree of life bare 12 manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month, Revelations 22, 2. This should be interpreted as 12 crops of fruit, one every month, month, and not 12 different varieties of fruit. Presumably, the fruit will be eaten, though this is not stated. The leaves of the trees are special as well. They are for healing the nations. This raises the question, from what will the nations need it? need to be healed. We can understand the inclusion of such a statement in Ezekiel's vision, Ezekiel 47, 12, for it pertained to the millennial earth. But in the heavenly city, we do not expect to see a need for healing. God will make all things new and there will be no more tears, Revelations 21, 4 through 5. So we assume that there will be no more illness. The answer may lie in a broader use of the word for healing. It could simply refer to the maintenance of health. The leaves in some way contribute to well-being and enjoyment of life in the heavenly city. The word nations in Revelations 22, 2 is an inclusive term to describe all God's redeemed ones, whatever their national or ethnic background is in life. Um, chapter 5, verse 9, chapter 7, verses 8 through 10. These, in, these distinctions will cease to matter in the eternal kingdom. The absence of a curse, Revelation 22, 3a. 
John concluded his comments on the healthy environment of the city with the declaration that there shall be no more curse. The Greek word used here found nowhere else in scripture refers to an item that has been placed under a curse. This may be even a stronger word than anathema, which is usually used of cursed things. The verb form of this noun is used of Peter's vehement cursing when he denied Jesus. Matt 26, 7, 74. Sin brought a curse on all God's creation, including human life itself. Genesis 3, 17 through 19, 5, 29, Romans 8, 22 through 23. A curse is also decreed on all who fail to keep God's law perfectly. Deuteronomy 27, 26, Galatians 3, 10. But Jesus took the curse of sin on himself when he died. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, Galatians 3, 13. And eventually all the cursed results of sin will be removed because of his substitution. Romans 8, 19 through 21. This does not happen all at once, but by the time eternity dawns, all traces of sin's curse will be gone. The impact of God's presence. Verse 3b, but the throne of God and the lamb shall be in it and his servant shall serve him. Verse 4. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. Verse five. And there shall be no night there, and there shall and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign for ever and ever. Face to face service. Revelations twenty two three b through four. The absence of the curse is matched by the presence of God. The throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it. Once again, the Lamb is seen as occupying the throne along with his Father. Chapter 5, verse 6, chapter 7, 17, chapter 21, verse 22, chapter 22, verse 1. This is as it should be, for this book is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Verse 1, 1. From the beginning to end, he is the indispensable focal point of all John's visions. Chapter 1, verse 17 through 18, chapter 22, verse 16, chapter and verse chapter 22, verse 13 and verse 16. And how will his saints occupy themselves throughout eternity? His servants shall serve him. Revelations 22:3. John called the saints servants, using the word for slaves or bound servants. It is true that Jesus declared his disciples friends instead of servants, John 15, 4-15, and that in the family of God, we are no longer servants but sons and heirs, Galatians 4, 7. Yet Jesus also taught that in the context of serving him, we should see ourselves as unprofitable slaves, Luke 17, 10. It was as such that New Testament writers, Paul, James, Peter, Jude, and John introduced themselves to their readers. And it surely is an appropriate term to describe those who serve the triumphant Christ throughout eternity, Revelations 22, 3. Yet the verb serve in this same verse does not speak of slavery, but as acts of worship, Romans 12, 1, Hebrews 9, 14, 12, 28, Revelation 7, 15. Redeemed saints who deem themselves no better than slaves consider it the highest privilege to serve and worship the King of Kings. Christ will also honor his servants, for they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads, Revelations 22, 4. That believers should see God's face is a remarkable statement. Moses was denied the opportunity to see his glory fully, lest he die. Exodus 33, 18-23, 1 Tim 6, 16. But the glorification of the saints and the removal of sin, there will no longer be a barrier to their approach. Matt 5, 8, 1 John 3, 2. Having God's name on one's forehead could possibly be a parallel to the gold plate on the forehead of Israel's high priest that proclaimed holiness to the Lord. Exodus 28, 
36 through 38. As the high priest represented the nation before God in his service, so every glorified believer will carry out his own priestly service. Revelations 1, 6, 5, 10, 20, and 6. However, it may simply signify believers' complete identification with God as they serve him. Revelations 3, 2, 7, 3, 14, 1. As the unbelieving world had been identified with the Antichrist through, through such a mark, 13, 16 through 18, 19, 20, so God's servants will receive this seal of belonging to him. Eternal light, Revelations 22, 5. And there shall be no night there, repeats a truth already established, 21, 23, and 25. Because it is obviously significant, in the original creation, God established light by his word, and he divided the times of light and darkness, Genesis 1, 3 through 5. In the new creation, there will be no need for night, and he himself will be the light of the city. Neither artificial nor natural luminaries will be necessary. Furthermore, they shall reign forever and ever, Revelations 22, 5. They refers to God's servants, verse 3, those who see themselves as his slaves and render worship, worshipful service will be exalted to positions of co-regents with God. They had previously reigned with him a thousand years, 20, verse 4, and then 6. Now they will reign forever. That fact should not be taken to mean they will have subjects under them. It is a way to say they share in Christ's royal dignity. The certainty of Christ's return. Chap verse 6. And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Verse 7. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. The truth of the angelic message, Revelations 22, 6. The angel speaking with John assured him that these sayings are faithful and true. This is the third time some such assurance is given. Chapter 19, verse 9, 21, verse 5. Perhaps this was necessary for John and his readers because these future realities would seem too fantastic to be true. They were a small minority in a hostile world and needed confidence that God would eventually triumph. These words that the angel spoke of thus refer not just to the description of the New Jerusalem, but to the visions of the entire book everything that would shortly take place. These visions were revealed by none other than the Lord, the God of the holy prophets, the same God who revealed his will and works, though select through selected prophets, has now revealed the culmination of his purpose to John through his angel. The message is therefore faithful and true. The things which must shortly be done, Revelations 2, 6, calls for further Comment first must imply that none of the things predicted in Revelation will happen by chance. They are all part of a divine plan that is preordained and will unfold precisely according to God's will. The world is not out of control. He worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Ephesians 1, 11 and 3. 11. Second, what should we make of the word shortly in Revelations 22, 6? It implies that something happens quickly, hastily, or without delay. Did the angel mean that all the prophecies of the book will come to pass immediately? After all, more than 2,000 years have passed and most have not yet been fulfilled. This is not the only New Testament passage in which we encounter such language of immediacy. 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 through 17, James 5, 8, 1 Peter 4, 7, 1 John 2, 18. They all relate to the expectancy believers ought to feel regarding the coming of the Lord. 
all that our present passage need imply is that even then God was setting in motion the events that would culminate in his eternal kingdom. Only he knows how long they will take, and we should be always ready for Christ's return. The reminder of Christ himself. Re Revelations 27, 22, 7. As Revelation draws to a close, Jesus adds his own word of confirmation. Behold, I come quickly. His return is the focal point of this entire apocalyptic, starting with a declaration in 1-7. Four times thereafter, Jesus declares, I come quickly. 3-11, 7 12, and then 20. It is a reminder to his church to be ready and waiting. Matt 20, 24, 44, 25, 13. Here our Lord pronounces blessings on the one who keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Revelations 22, 7, 1, 3. To keep is to heed or observe what is written. It is significant that Revelation begins and ends with a blessing, not on the one who fills his mind with its images or deciphers its figurative language, but on the one who obeys its teachings. Prophecy is not given to satisfy our curiosity about the future, but to enhance our character by making us more like Jesus. Let us remember that Revelation was addressed to seven specific churches in John's day, 1-4. The glorious vision of the exalted Christ in chapter 1 is followed immediately by admonishing to these churches in chapters 2 and 3. If the prophecy had moral and ethical implications for them, it surely does for us as well. Titus 2, 11 through 14, 1 John 3, 2 to 3. Let us see Christ's return, not as an abstract tenet of theology, but as a living, transforming hope. Questions. What? One, what similarities does the garden in the New Jerusalem have to the Garden of Eden? Two, what does the river of water of life symbolize? Three, why can the tree of life have no legitimate use in a sinful world? Four, what purpose will the leaves of the tree of life have? Five, what is signified by the removal of the curse in the heavenly city? Six, why does the lamb have such a prominent role in revelations? Seven, how will the servants of God be honored in the new Jerusalem? Eight, why did John and his readers need the reminder that the words given were faithful and true? Nine, how could it be said that the events portrayed would occur shortly? 10. What effect should prophecy have on those who read it? This concludes the Sunday School lesson for Sunday, November 20th, 2016. Thank you for listening. God bless.